Chapter Sixteen of The Hound from the North by Ridgewell Cullum. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Lisa Reichert. Chapter Sixteen: An Echo from the Alaskan Mountains. Alice searched all over the farm for her friend. The last place in which she thought of looking was the little bedroom the two girls shared. Here, at length, she arrived, and a shock awaited her. Prudence was sitting beside the window. She was gazing out at the bare, harvested fields, nor did she turn at her friend's approach. It was not until Alice spoke that she looked around. "'Here you are, Prue. Why, whatever's the matter?' she exclaimed, as she noted the grey pallor of the face before her, the drawn lines about the mouth, the fiercely burning eyes. "'You poor soul! You are ill! And you never told me a word about it! I've been looking everywhere for you. It's tea-time. What is it, dear?' "'Do I look ill?' Prudence asked wearily. She passed her hand across her forehead. She was almost dazed. Then she went on as she turned again to the window. "'I'm all right. My head is aching, that's all. I don't think I want any tea.' The next moment she was all alertness. "'Has Hervey returned from the fields?' "'Hervey? Yes, why? He's returned and gone away again, gone into Winnipeg.' He nearly frightened poor Mother Hepsy out of her wits, came in all of a sudden and declared he must hurry off to Winnipeg at once, and he wanted Andy to drive him. You know his way. He wouldn't give any explanation. He was like a bear to his mother. My fingers were just itching to slap his face. But come along, dear. You must have some tea. It'll do your head good. While she was speaking, Alice's eyes never left her friend's face. There was something about Prudence's expression she didn't like. Her mind at once reverted to thoughts of fever and sunstroke and such things, but she said nothing that might cause alarm. She merely persisted when the other shook her head. Eventually her persuasions prevailed. Mother Hepsy's fretting away downstairs, and Sarah is backing her up. The long-suffering Mary has been catching it in consequence. So come along and be your most cheerful self, Prue. The poor old dears must be humoured and Alice, with gentle insistence, led her companion down to the parlour. "'And where, miss, have you been all this precious time?' asked Mrs. Molling when the two girls reached the parlour. "'Sleeping, I'll be bound, to judge by them spectacles around your eyes. There's no get-up about young folks nowadays,' she went on, turning to Sarah. Six hours sleep for healthy-minded women,' I says, "'not an hour more, nor an hour less.' "'Sister Emma was allus one of them for her siesta. "'Then she turned back to Prudence. "'Maybe she learned you, my girl.' "'I haven't been sleeping, mother,' Prudence protested, "'taking her place at the table. "'I don't feel very well.' "'Oh, you don't say so,' exclaimed the old lady, "'all anxiety at once. "'And why didn't you tell me before? "'Now maybe you got a touch of the sun?' "'Have you been feeling faint and giddy?' asked Sarah, fixing her quiet eyes upon the girl's face. "'No, I don't think so. I've got a headache, nothing more.' "'Ah, cold bath and lemon soda,' observed her mother practically. "'Tea and be left alone,' suggested Sarah. "'Nature designs all human ills, but in the making, suggests the cure which best is for the taking.' Her steady old eyes seemed able to penetrate mere outward signs. "'Quite right, Aunt Sarah,' said Alice decidedly. "'Leave the nostrums and quackeries alone. "'Prue will be all right after a nice cup of tea. "'Now, Mother Hepsy, one of your best for the invalid, "'and please, I'll have some more ham.' "'That you shall, you flighty harem scarum, "'and to think of the likes of you dictating to me "'about nostrums and physickings,' replied the farm wife with a comfortable laugh. "'I'll soon be having Mary teaching me to toss a buckwheat slapjack.' Now, see and cut from the sides of that ham where the curin's primest. I do allow, as the hams didn't cure just so last winter. Folks at my board must have of the best. I never knew anyone to get anything else here, laughed Alice. Then she turned her head sharply and sat listening. Mrs. Molling looked over towards the window. Prudence silently sipped her tea, keeping her eyes lowered as much as possible. She knew that, in spite of their talk, these kindly people were worried about her, and she tried hard to relieve their anxiety. "'Someone for us,' said Alice, as the sound of horses' hooves came in through the open window. 
"'Someone from Lakeville, I expect,' said Mrs. Malling, making a guess. "'That's George Iredale's horse,' said Sarah, who had detected the sound of a pacer's gait. Prudence looked up in a startled, frightened way. Sarah was looking directly at her. She made no further comment aloud, but contented herself with a quiet mental note. "'Something wrong,' she thought, "'and it's to do with him. Poor child, poor child.' Maybe she's fretting herself because... Her reflections were abruptly broken off as the sound of a man's voice hailing at the front door penetrated to the parlour. "'Anyone in?' cried the voice, and instantly Alice sprang to her feet. "'It's Rob!' she exclaimed. There was a clatter as her chair fell back behind her. She nearly fell over it, reached the door, and the next moment those in the parlour heard the sound of joyous exclamations proceeding from the hall. Prudence's expression was a world of relief. Her mother was overjoyed. "'This is really good. Bring him in, bring him in, Miss Thoughtless. Don't keep him there a philandering when there's good fare in the parlour. "'Love feeds on kisses, we read in ancient lay, meaning the love of yore, not of to-day.' murmured Sarah, with a pensive smile, while she turned expectantly to greet the visitor. Radiant, her face shining with conscious happiness, Alice led her fiancé into the room, and Rob Chillingwood found himself sitting before the farm-wife's generous board almost before he was aware of it. While he was being served, he had to face a running fire of questions from at least three of the ladies present. Rob was a cheerful soul, and ever ready with a pleasant laugh. This snatched holiday from a stress of underpaid work was like a bunk to a schoolboy. It was more delightful to him by reason of the knowledge that he would have to pay up for it afterwards with extra exertions and overtime work. "'You didn't tell us when you were coming,' said Alice. "'Didn't know myself. Thought I'd ride over from Iredale's place on spec. "'And you've come from there now?' asked Mrs. Malling. Prudence looked up eagerly. "'Yes, I've just bought all his stock for a Scotch client of mine.' "'Scotch?' Sarah turned away with a motion of disgust. "'What, has George sold all his beasties at last?' exclaimed the farm-wife. "'Why, yes, didn't you know? He's giving up his ranch.' Rob looked round the table in surprise. There was a pause. Then Mrs. Malling broke in. "'He has spoken of it, hinted. But we wasn't expecting it so soon.' He's made his pile. Yes, he must have done so, said Rob readily. The price he parted with his cattle to me for was ridiculous. I shall make a large profit out of my client. It'll all help towards furnishing, Al, he went on, turning to his fiancée. I'm so glad you are doing well now, Rob, the girl replied with a happy smile. Yes. The man turned to Mrs. Mulling. We're going to get married this fall. I hope Alice has been learning something of housekeeping, with a laugh. Why, yes, Alice knows a deal more than she reckons to let on, I guess, said the farm wife with a fat chuckle. Prudence now spoke for the first time since Rob's arrival. She looked up suddenly, and though she tried hard to speak conversationally, there was a slightly eager ring in her voice. When is George Iredale going to leave the ranch? Rob turned to her at once. "'Can't say. Not yet, I should think. He seems to have made no preparations. Besides, I've got to see him again in a day or two. "'Then you will stay out here?' asked Alice eagerly. "'Well, no,' Rob shook his head with a comical expression of chagrin. "'Can't be done, I'm afraid. But I'll come over here when I'm in the neighbourhood, if possible.' Then to Mrs. Malling, "'May I?' "'Why, certainly,' said the farm-wife, with characteristic heartiness. If you come to this district without so much as a look in here, well, you can just pass right along for the future. When the meal was over, the old lady rose from the table. Alice, said she, you stay right here. Sarah and I'll clear away. Prudence, my girl, just lie down and get your rest. Maybe you'll feel better later on. Come along, Sarah. The young folks can get on comfortably without us for once. Prudence made no attempt to do as her mother suggested. She moved about the room, helping with the work. Then the two old ladies adjourned to the kitchen. Rob and Alice moved over to the well-worn sofa at the far end of the room, and Prudence took up her position at the open window. She seemed to have no thought of leaving the lovers together, 
In fact, it seemed as though she had forgotten their existence altogether. She stood staring out over the little front garden with hard, unmeaning eyes. From her expression, it is doubtful if she saw what her eyes looked upon. Her thoughts were of other matters that concerned only herself and another. The low tones of the lovers sounded monotonously through the room. They, too, were now wrapped in their own concerns, and had forgotten the presence of the girl at the window. They had so much to say, and so little time in which to say it, for Rob had to make Ainsley that night. The cool August evening was drawing on. The threshing gang was returning from the fields, and the purple haze of sundown was rising above the eastern horizon. Prudence did not move. Her hands were clasped before her. Her pale face might have been of carved stone. There was only the faintest sign of life about her, and that was the steady rise and fall of her bosom. A cool breeze rustled in through the open window and set the curtains moving. Then all became still again. Two birds squabbled viciously amongst the branches of a blue gum in the little patch of a garden, but Prudence's gaze was still directed towards the horizon. She saw nothing. She felt nothing but the pain which her own thoughts brought her. Suddenly the sound of something moving outside became audible. There was the noisy yawn of some large animal rising from its rest. Then came the slow, heavy patter of the creature's feet. Nash approached the window. His fierce-looking head stood well above the sill. His greenish eyes looked up solemnly at the still figure framed in the opening. His ears twitched attentively. There was no friendly motion of his straight, lank tail, but his appearance was undoubtedly expressive of some sort of well-meaning canine regard. Whether the dog understood and sympathized with the girl at the window, it would have taken something more than a keen observer to have said. But in his strangely unyielding fashion, he was certainly struggling to convey something to this girl from whom he was accustomed to receive nothing but kindness. For some moments he stood thus quite still. His unkempt body rose and fell under his wiry coat. He was a vast beast, and the wolf-gray and black of his coloring was horribly suggestive of his ancestry. Presently he lifted one great paw to the window. Balancing his weight upon his only serviceable hind leg, he lifted himself and stood with both front feet upon the sill, and pushed his nose against the girl's dress. She awoke from her reverie at the touch, and her hands unclasped, and she slowly caressed the bristly head. The animal seemed to appreciate the attention, for, with his powerful paws, he drew himself further into the room. The girl offered no objection, she paid no heed to what he was doing. Her hand merely rested on his head, and she thought no more about him. Finding himself unrebuffed, Nesh made further efforts. Then, suddenly, he became aware of the other occupants of the room. Quick as a flash, his nose was directed towards the old sofa on which they were seated, and his eyes, like two balls of phosphorescent light, gleamed in their direction. He became motionless at once. It seemed as though he were uncertain of something. He was inclined to resent the presence of these two, but the caress of the soft, warm hand checked any hostile demonstration beyond a whine, half plaintive, half of anger. The disturbing sound drew Alice's attention, and she looked over to where Prudence was standing. It was then she encountered the unblinking stare of the hound's wicked eyes. The sight thrilled her for a moment, nor could she repress a slight shudder. She nudged her companion and drew his attention without speaking. Rob followed the direction of her gaze, and a silence followed whilst he surveyed the strange apparition. He could only see the dog's head, the rest of the creature was hidden behind the window curtain, and its enormous size suggested the great body and powerful limbs which remained concealed. To Rob there was a suggestion of hell about the cruel luster of the relentless eyes. At last he broke into a little nervous laugh. "'By Jove,' he said, "'I thought for a moment I'd got him. Gee whiz! The brute looks like the devil himself. What is it? Whose?' Without replying, Alice called to her friend. "'Let Nesh come in, Prue,' she said. "'That is, dubiously, if you think it's safe.' Then she turned to Rob. "'He's so savage that I'm afraid of him. Still, with Prue here, I think he'll be all right. He's devoted to her.' At the sound of the girl's voice, Prudence turned back from the window like one awakening from a dream. 
Her eyes still had a faraway look in them, and though she had heard the voice, it seemed doubtful as to whether she had taken the meaning of the words. For a moment her eyes rested on Alice's face, then they drooped to the dog at her side, but Alice was forced to repeat her question before the other moved. Then, in silence, she stepped back and summoned the dog to her with an encouraging chirrup. Nesh needed no second bidding. There was a scramble and a scraping of sharp claws upon the woodwork. Then the animal stood in the room. And his attitude, as he eyed the two seated upon the sofa, said as plainly as possible, Well, which one of you is to be first? Rob felt uneasy. Alice was decidedly alarmed at the dog's truculent appearance. But the tension was relieved a moment later by the brute's own strange behaviour. Suddenly, without the slightest warning, Nesh plumped down upon his hindquarters. His pricked ears drooped, and his two forepaws began to beat a sort of tattoo upon the floor. Then followed a broken whine, tremulous and blandishing, and the great head moved from side to side with that curious movement which only dogs use to express their gladness. Then the strange three-legged beast went further. Down he threw himself full length upon the floor and grovelled effusively, whining and scraping the boards in a perfect fervour of abject delight. Rob looked hard at the dog. Then he laughed and turned to Alice. What is the creature's name? I didn't catch it. Nesh, she replied. Rob held out his hand encouragingly and called the dog by name. The animal continued to squirm, but did not offer to come nearer. Every now and then its head was turned back, and the green eyes looked up into Prudence's face. At last Rob ceased his efforts. His blandishments were ineffectual, beyond increasing the dog's effusive display. "'A husky,' he said, looking across at Prudence. "'A bad dog to have about the house. He reminds me of the animals we had up north in our dog train. They're devils to handle, and as fierce as wild cats. We had one just like him, unusually big brute.' He was our wheeler, the most vicious dog of the lot. The resemblance is striking. By Jove, he went on reminiscently. He was a sulky, cantankerous cuss. His name was Sitting Bull, after the renowned Sioux Indian chief. We had to be very careful of the other dogs on account of his scrapping propensities. He killed one poor beast. I think we nicknamed him rather appropriately. He was affectionately dubbed Bully. As Rob pronounced the name, he held out his hand again and flicked his fingers. The dog rose from his groveling posture and came eagerly forward, wagging his lank tail. He rubbed his nose against the man's hand and slowly licked the suntan skin. Rob's brow drew together in a pucker of deep perplexity. He looked the animal over long and earnestly, and slowly there crept into his eyes an expression of wondering astonishment. He was interrupted in his inspection by the girl at his side. "'Why, he's treating you like an old friend, Rob.' The man sat gazing down upon the wiry coat of the beast. "'Yes,' he said shortly. Then he looked over at Prudence. "'Yours?' he went on. The girl shook her head. "'No, he belongs to Hervey.' "'Hm, I wonder where he got him from,' in a meditative tone. "'Somewhere out in the wilds of the Yukon,' put in Alice." Ah, the Yukon! And Rob's face was serious as he turned towards the window and looked out at the creeping shadows of evening. There was a pause. Prudence was thinking of anything but the subject of Rob's inquiries. Alice was curious, but she forbore to question. She had heard her lover's account of his misadventures in the Alaskan hills, but she saw no connection between the hound and that disastrous affair. But the man's thoughts were hard at work. Presently he rose to depart. He bade Prudence good-bye and moved towards the door. The dog remained where he had been standing and looked after him. At the door Rob hesitated. Then he turned and looked back. Poor old bully, he said. With a bound the dog was at his side. Then the man turned away and, accompanied by Alice, left the room. In the passage he paused, and Alice saw an expression on his face she had never seen before. He was nervous and excited, and his eyes shone in the half-light. Al, he said slowly, I know that dog, and his name is Bully. Don't say anything to anybody. Hervey may be able to tell me something of those who robbed us up in the hills. But on no account must you say anything to him. 
Leave it to me. I shall come here again, soon. Good-bye, little woman. That evening, as Rob Chillingwood rode back to Ainsley, he thought of many things, but chiefly he reviewed the details of that last disastrous journey, when he and Gray had traversed the snowfields of Alaska together. End of chapter 16「Chapter Seventeen of the Hound from the North by Ridgewell Cullum. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Lisa Reichert. Chapter Seventeen The Last of Lonely Ranch. There are moments which come in all lives when calm reflection is powerless to influence the individual acts, when calmness, even in the most phlegmatic natures, is impossible when a tide of impulse sweeps us on, giving us not even so much as a breathless, momentary pause in which to consider the result of our headlong career. We blunder up against every jagged obstacle, lacerated and bleeding, jolting cruelly from point to point, whither our passions irresistibly drive us. It is a blind, reckless journey, from which there is no escape when the tide sets in. We see our goal ahead, and we fondly believe that because it is ahead we must come to it. We do not consider the awful road we travel, nor the gradual exhaustion which is overtaking us. We do not realize that we must fall by the wayside for lack of strength, nor even, if our strength be sufficient to carry us on to the end, do we ask ourselves, shall we be able to draw aside out of the raging torrent when our goal is reached? Or shall we be swept on to the yawning beyond, where, for evermore, we must continue to struggle hopelessly to return? Once give passion unchecked sway, and who can say what the end will be? It was at such a moment in her life at which prudence had arrived. Her mind was set upon an object which absorbed all her faculties, all her brain, all her feelings. Had she been able to pause even for one moment, reason must have asserted itself, and she would have understood the folly of what she was doing. But that moment was denied her. All the latent passions of a strong nature had been let loose, and she was swept on by their irresistible tide. She believed that she was the appointed avenger of the man she had once loved, and that this duty unfulfilled would be a crime, the stain of which nothing could wipe out. Iredale must be confronted, challenged, and... And so she came to Lonely Ranch on her self-imposed errand of justice. The man she sought was not in the house when she came. The valley seemed to be devoid of life as she rode up, but the solitude was almost instantly broken by the appearance of Chintz from the region of the barn. She dispatched him in search of his master and passed into the bachelor's sitting-room to await his coming. She was restless, and her nerves were strung to a great tension. Her eyes still shone with that peculiar light which ever seemed to look out of her brother's. There was no yielding in the set of her mouth. Her resolve disfigured the sweetness which usually characterized her beautiful features. She stood before the window, looking out upon the shadow-bathed valley. She saw before her the dark wall of foliage which rose to the heights of the front hill. Not a living soul was about. Only was there a rising wind which disturbed the unbroken forest of pines. She turned abruptly from the view as though she could not bear the solitude which was thus made so apparent. She crossed over to where the bookcase stood against the wall and glanced in through the glazed doors. But she comprehended nothing of what she saw. She was thinking, and her mind was in a tumult of hysterical fancies. And she was listening, too, listening for a sound, any sound other than that which the wind made. Mechanically, she came over to the table and leant against it in an attitude of abstraction. She shivered. She stood up to steady herself, and she shivered again. And all the time the frenzied eyes gleamed in their beautiful oval setting, the lips were drawn inwards, and there remained only a sharp-defined line to mark the sweet mouth. Presently her lips parted, and she moistened them with her tongue. A fever seemed to be upon her, and mouth and throat were parched. Suddenly the sound for which she waited came. She darted eagerly to the window, and saw Chintz pass round in the direction of the barn. 
Then she saw the burly figure of the man she was awaiting appear in the clearing fronting the house. George Iredale came along at a robust gait. He was clad in moleskin riding breeches, much stained with clay, as though he had been digging. A soft shirt, the sleeves of which were rolled up above the elbow, his Stetson hat was adjusted to the correct angle upon his head, and he wore a pair of tan-coloured field boots, much smeared with the signs of toil. He came rapidly towards the house. There was nothing furtive, nothing guilty about this man's bearing. He came readily to meet his visitor, and his appearance was the confident bearing of a man who has little to fear. She saw him look towards the window where she stood, and his smile of welcome set her nerves tingling with a sensation she failed to understand. Her hand went round to the pocket of her linen riding skirt and remained there. She heard him step in the hall. She heard him approach and turn the door handle. As he came into the room, she faced him. "'Why, Prudence, this is delightful,' he began, but she interrupted him coldly. "'One moment,' she said, and her voice was hoarse with the dryness of her throat. "'I have not come over for any visit of pleasure, but strictly upon a matter of—of of business. There are some explanations which we both need to make, but more especially you.' Yes, Iredale was gazing earnestly into the face before him. He was trying to fathom the meaning of her coldness. For the moment he wondered, then slowly he began to understand that Hervey had been at work. You got my note, he said, choosing to ignore the result of his observations. My delay in calling at the farm was unavoidable. I am in the midst of disposing of my ranch. I had not expected that I should have been called upon to do so so soon. I beg that you will forgive me what must seem an unwarrantable delay. Prudence's nerves were so strung that she felt as though she could strike him for his calm words. Her condition demanded the opposition of passion equal to her own. His coolness maddened her. So long had she dwelt upon the accusation Hervey had brought against him that she believed in this man's guilt. The evidence of her own senses had militated against him, and now she steeled herself in an armour of unbelief, but in spite of herself the dictates of her heart were struggling hard to find the joints of her armour. Nor were the struggles lessened now that she stood confronting him. His coolness, though maddening to her, was not without effect. The moral influence he wielded was great. She backed to the table, then she plunged into the subject of her mission without further preamble. Her eyes stared straight into his, and her tones sounded incisively in the stillness of the room. I little knew the man whom I was listening to when he offered me his life, nor had I an idea of how near I was to the man who inspired the words which have appeared in the paper, the words which were the last Leslie Gray ever uttered. What must have been your feelings when I told you that I knew their author to be a murderer? then with scathing bitterness but your feelings must have long since been dead dead as the poor creature you so wantonly sent to his reckoning the time has come for you to defend yourself that is if defence you can offer no flimsy excuse or extenuation will cover you even the scriptures teach us that the penalty is a life for a life yours is the hand that struck leslie down and now you must face the consequences of your wanton act. Iredale's quiet eyes never attempted to avoid the girl's direct gaze, nor did he flinch as the accusation fell from her lips. Never was he more alert, never more gently disposed towards this half-demented creature than at that moment. He recognized the hand that had been at work, and he laid no blame upon her. His feelings were of sorrow, sorrow for the woman he loved and sorrow for himself but his thoughts were chiefly for her he knew as she had said that his time had come so hervey has been to you to sell the discovery which i rejected at the price he asked he told you that i was a smuggler that the announcement in the paper was mine and did he tell you that i was the murderer of leslie gray or did your heart prompt you to that conclusion the girl supported herself against the table with one hand, and the other was still in the pocket behind her. Iredale noted these things without moving his eyes from her face. 
Hervey told me the facts and the inevitable proof they bore. Nor was his statement exaggerated. My own reason told me that. The man sighed. He had hoped that the work had been only of the brother's doings. He had hoped that she had come bearing Hervey's accusations and not her own. "'Go on,' he said. "'I know you for what you really are, George Iredale, and now I have come to you to give you the chance of defending yourself. No man must be condemned without a hearing. Neither shall you. The evidence against you is overwhelming. I can see no escape for you. But speak, if you have anything to say in your defence, and I will listen. I charge you with the murder of Leslie Gray." Just for one brief moment Iredale felt a shiver pass through his body. The icy tones of the girl's voice, the seemingly dispassionate words, filled him with a horror unspeakable. Then he pulled himself together. He was on his defence before the one person in the world from whose condemnation he shrank. He did not answer at once. He wished to make no mistake. When at last he spoke, his words came slowly, as though he weighed well each syllable before he gave it utterance. With one exception, all that Hervey has doubtless said of me is true. I am a smuggler. I inspired that line in the paper. But I am no murderer. Leslie Gray's life was sacred to me at the time, if only for the reason that he was your affianced husband. I loved you at that time, as I have loved you for years, and all my thoughts and wishes were for your happiness. It would have made you happy to have married Gray. Therefore, I wish that you should marry him. I am quite unchanged. I will tell you now what neither you nor Hervey knows, even though it makes my case look blacker. I knew that Gray was on my track. I knew that he had discovered my secret. How he had done so, I cannot say. He quarrelled with me, and, in the heart of his anger, told me of his intentions. It was late one night, at a card party at your house, and just before he was so foully murdered. No doubt you, or any right-minded person for that matter, will say that this evidence only clinches the case against me. But, in spite of it, I assert my innocence. Amongst my many sins, the crime Hervey charges me with, he purposely avoided associating the charge with her, is not numbered. Can I hope that you will believe me? The gentle tones in which the burly man spoke, the earnest fearlessness which looked out from his quiet eyes, gave infinite weight to all he said. Prudence shook her head slowly but the fire in her eyes was less bright, and the voice of her own heart crying out began to make itself heard in the midst of her chaotic thought. She tried to stiffen herself for the task she had undertaken, but the result was not all she sought. Still, she replied coldly, How can I believe, with all the black evidence against you, you, in all this region, were the one man interested in Leslie's death? His life meant penitentiary to you, his death meant liberty. Your own words tell me that. How can I believe such a denial as you now make? Tell me, have you no proof to offer? Account for the day on which Leslie met his death. Prove your movements upon that day. The girl's denial of belief was belied by the eagerness in her voice. For one brief instant a flash of hope rose in her. She saw a loophole for her lover. She longed to believe him but the hope died down, leaving her worse distracted for its coming. For Iredale did not speak, and his face assumed a look of gloom. "'Ah, you cannot, you cannot!' she went on hysterically. "'I might have known, I did know!' A world of passion again leapt into her eyes. Then something of the woman broke through her anger, and a heart-breaking piteousness sounded in her voice. "'Oh, why, why did you do this thing?' Why did you stain your hands with such a crime as murder? What would his living have meant to you, at worst the penitentiary? Was it worth it to destroy thus the last chance of your immortal soul? Oh, God, and to think of it, a murderer! Then the fierce anger became dominant once more. But you shall not escape. Your crime shall be expiated as far as human crimes can be expiated. The gallows awaits you, George Iredale and your story shall be told to the world. 
You shall hang, unless you give to judge and jury a better denial than you have given to me. She suddenly broke off. A whistling, indrawn breath startled the man before her. She gazed round her wildly. She had remembered what she had come for. She had forgotten when she had talked of judge and jury. Her face assumed a ghastly hue at the recollection. Her eyes alone still told of the madness that possessed her. Nor was Iredale without an uneasy feeling at what he saw. That catch of breath, that hunted look as she gazed about the room. Intuition served him in the moment of crisis. What was the meaning? Why was that hand concealed in her dress? There was only one possible answer to such questions, and he read the answer aright. Prudence, he said, in his deep musical voice, whilst his keen eyes riveted her attention. I can prove my innocence of the crime you charge me with. Listen to me patiently, and I will tell you how. Do not let your anger drive you to any rash act which might bring you lifelong regret. The girl made a sharp ejaculation, but she did not attempt to interrupt him. I can prove that I was not within three hundred miles of this place on the day of Leslie's death, the man went on that I was in the city, to the west of here, distributing, bitterly, my wares. I can prove all this to you, and I intend that before you leave me today you shall be a witness to my innocence, even against all prejudice. But before judge and jury it will be different, very different, he sighed. There I cannot prove my innocence, for to do so would be to betray my comrades, those who have traded with me and trusted me, and send them to the penal servitude which only awaits me. His eyes had become reflective. He seemed to be talking to himself now rather than to the woman before him. No, I cannot save myself at such a cost. Even to escape the gallows I will not play the part of Judas. The woman made no reply. She stood staring at him, with all that was best in her shining in her eyes, she was trying to follow his every word and to take his meaning, and the one thought which dominated her whole mind was his expressed ability to prove his innocence to her. He seemed to awake from some melancholy reverie, and again his eyes sought hers. Do you wish me to prove my innocence? Yes, you must. You shall. The girl moved from the table, and for the first time during the interview, her hand was removed from the pocket in her skirt. Hope filled the heart in which but now the fires of hell had seemed to burn. She drank in his words with soul-consuming thirst. The proof, that was what she required. Iredale went on with grave gentleness. The proof is in here. He moved to the bookcase and opened a secret recess in the back of it. In this cupboard. He produced a pile of books and brought them to the table. Picking out one, he opened it at the date of Gray's death. It was a diary. He read out the entries for the entire week, all of which bore out his testimony. Every one was dated at a different town or village and related to his sales of opium. He then opened another book and showed the entries of his sales and the figures. He went through the whole pile, book after book, and all of them bore out his statement as to his whereabouts. Then he produced several contracts. These were deeds between himself and various traders, and were dated at the towns at which they were signed. Each book and paper he passed on to Prudence for her scrutiny, drawing her attention to the corroboration in the evidence. There could be no doubt as to the genuineness of these facts, and the girl's last shadowy doubts of his innocence evaporated before the overwhelming detail. The hope which had filled her heart was now replaced by a triumphant joy. This man had shown her, had convinced her, and she wanted nothing more at that moment. She looked up into his face, hoping to see a reflection of her own happiness in it. But there was no happiness there. His face was calm, but the melancholy had deepened in his eyes. What she saw came like an icy douche to her, and the happy expression died upon her lips. She suddenly remembered that he had said he could not use this evidence to publicly declare his innocence. But, she began, he shook his head. He knew that she wished to protest. For a moment they looked into each other's eyes. 
Then the woman, the weaker, broke down under the strain. Tears came to her eyes, and she poured out all the pent-up grief of her hours of misery. "'Oh, George,' she cried, "'can you ever forgive my wickedness? I ought never to have believed. My heart told me that you were innocent, but the evidence, oh, the evidence! I could see no loophole. Everything pointed to you, you. And I, wretch that I am, I believed.' and the girl sobbed as though her heart would break. Iredale made no attempt to soothe her. He felt that it would be good for her to weep. She leant against the table, and after a while her sobs quietened. Then the man touched her upon the shoulder. Don't cry, Prue. My heart bleeds for you when I listen to your sobs. You're not to blame for believing me guilty. Twelve jurymen will shortly do the same, and who can blame them? He shrugged. I must face the music and take my chance. And now, child, he added, his hand still resting upon her shoulder, and smiling down upon her from his superior height, give me that which you have concealed in your pocket. We will throw it away. Prudence sprang up and moved beyond his reach. No, no, I can't. Don't ask me. Spare me the shame of it. As you love me, George, don't ask me for it. As you will, dear. I merely wish to rid ourselves of an ugly presence. While we are together, and it may not be for long now, nothing should come between us, least of all that. The girl's tears had dried. She looked over at her lover. His compelling influence was upon her. She paused irresolute. Then she plunged her hand into her pocket and drew forth a large revolver. Here, take it. Take it and do what you like with it. Then she laughed bitterly. You know me as I am now. I brought that to shoot you with, and afterwards to shoot myself. You see, I am a murderess at heart. And she smiled bitterly. Iredale took the weapon and placed it in his bookcase. Then he came to the girl's side and put his arm tenderly about her shoulders. Forget it, child. Forget it as you would a hideous dream. Your feelings were forced upon you, while through my wretched doings. That which I have done to gain wealth has brought only what might have been expected in its train— no work of evil is without its sting, and as is always the case, that sting seeks out the most sensitive part of its victim. The chastisement for my wrongdoing has been inflicted with cruel cunning, for you, Prue, have been made to suffer. Thus is my punishment a hundredfold greater. He drew her to him as he spoke, and gently smoothed her dark hair. Under the influence of his touch and the sound of his voice, the girl calmed, she nestled close to his side, and for a moment abandoned herself to the delight of being with him. But her thoughts would not remain idle for long. Suddenly she released herself and moved to arm's length from him. George, she said in a tone of suppressed eagerness, they cannot try you for, for murder. You will tell them. You will show them all these. For my sake, for the sake of all your friends, you will not let them condemn you. Oh, you can't allow it. Think. She went on more passionately. No men would willingly let you be declared guilty when they know you to be innocent. It must not be. Iredale gave no outward sign. He had turned his face away and was gazing in the direction of the window. His reflective eyes looked out upon the valley, but his resolve was written plainly in them. Do not tempt me, Prue, he said quietly. Were I to do otherwise than I have resolved, and obtained an acquittal thereby, I should live a life of utter regret. I should despise myself. I should loathe my own shadow. Nothing could be more revolting to me than the man who plays the part of a traitor. And were I that man, life would be impossible to me. Think of it only for one moment, sweetheart, and your own good heart will tell you how impossible it is, that which you ask me to do. It cannot be. All the world would despise me. But even so, its utmost execration would be nothing compared with my own feelings, at the thought that I had saved myself by such methods. He withdrew his hand from her embrace. No, when the time comes and I am forced to stand my trial for Gray's murder, I shall face it. Nor shall I betray my friends by one single word. And, too, when that time comes, there will not remain one single trace of the traffic which has hitherto been part of my very existence. There shall be no possible chance of discovery for those who have trusted me. Your brother Hervey will never hold his hand. I know that. I realized that when he left me after seeking blackmail. His vindictive nature will see this through. 
and perhaps I would rather have it so. It will then be settled once and for all. I may get off, but I fear that it will be otherwise. At the mention of her brother's name, Prudence started, and the blood receded from her anxious face, leaving it ghastly in its pallor. She had forgotten that he was even now on his way to Winnipeg for the express purpose of denouncing Iredale. For one instant she shook like an aspen, then she recovered herself. What was to be done? She tried to think. This matter of Hervey was of her doing. She had driven him to it, urged him to it. Now she realized the full horror of what her foolish credulity had led her into. It had been in her power to stay his hand, at least to draw his fangs. Now it was too late. Suddenly she turned upon her lover in one final appeal. At that moment it seemed the only chance of saving him. "'George, there is a way out of it all. One last resource, if you will only listen to me. You love me even in spite of the way I have wronged you. You belong to me if only by reason of our love. You have no right to throw your life away when you are innocent. God knows I honour you for your decision not to betray your companions. If it was possible, I love you more than ever. But the sin would be as great to throw your life away for such a shadow as it would be to deliver your friends up to justice.' You can save yourself. You must. The border is near. We are right on it. Surely the way you have brought the Chinese into the country should provide an exit for us. Oh, my poor love, will you not listen to me? Will you not give me the life I crave? George, let us go, together. Her words came passionately. She had stepped forward and placed her two brown hands upon his great shoulders, and her dark, earnest eyes gazed lovingly up into his. The temptation was a sore one, and the man found it hard to resist. He experienced a sudden rush of blood to the brain. His body seemed to be on fire. He was pulsating with a mad passion. The thought of what she suggested came near to overthrowing his sternest resolve. To go with her, to have her evermore by his side. The thought was maddening. Surely he had never realized until that moment how dearly he loved this woman but his strong nature came to his rescue in time. The passion had died down as swiftly as it had risen, and left him cold and collected. He gazed down into the brown eyes ever so kindly, ever so lovingly, and his answer came in a tone so gentle that the girl felt that whatever the future might hold for them, this moment had been worth living for. No, no, sweetheart, not flight, even though you would be my companion. We love one another dearly, and for that very fact I could never allow myself to remain under this cloud. At all costs we will have the matter cleared. I owe it to you, to those at the farm, and to myself. The girl's hands dropped to her sides, and she turned away. Then all the agony of her soul found vent in one exclamation. "'Oh, God!' she cried, and with that last cry came the revealing flash which answered the question she had so repeatedly asked herself. She turned back to her lover, and the agonized expression of her face had changed, and in her eyes was the eager light of excitement. Iredale saw the change, but did not recognize its meaning. He felt that she must no longer remain there. "'Child, I want you to go back to the farm and tell them of the accusation that has been brought against me. Tell them all the circumstances of it.' Tell them that I have clearly convinced you of my innocence, but as you love me, I charge you not to reveal the manner in which it was done. Tell your mother that I shall come over tomorrow, and she shall hear the whole story from my lips. I wish to do this that she may hear my version before she reads of what must happen in the papers. After that, I shall go into Winnipeg and set the law in motion. I will clear myself, or otherwise. But on your honour you must promise— that all I have shown you to-day remains a secret between us. Prudence listened intently to all he said, but a quiet look of resolve slowly crept into her eyes. I promise, she said, and Iredale thanked her with a look. There was the briefest of pauses, then she went on. On one condition. What do you mean? Iredale looked his surprise. Now you must hear me, George, she went on eagerly. You have charged me with this thing. You must abide by my time. A day more or less can make little difference to you. But I wish to give myself up before others can make the charge. Just so. And in the meantime, I want your promise 
not to come to the farm until the... She paused to make a swift mental calculation. Day after tomorrow at four o'clock in the afternoon. Tell me your reason. That is my own. The girl was smiling now. Then she again became excited. Promise, promise, promise. There is no time to lose. Even now I fear we are too late. Iredale looked dubiously at her. Suddenly he saw her face darken. Promise, she demanded fiercely, or I will not abide by my promise to you. I promise. An expression of relief came into Prudence's eyes, and she stepped towards him and looked up into his face. Good-bye, George, dearest. The man suddenly clasped her in a bear-like embrace and rained passionate, burning kisses on her upturned lips. Then quietly she released herself. She stood away from him, holding one of his great hands in both of hers. Quick, now my horse! Iredale departed, and Prudence was left alone. She stood looking after him, thinking, thinking. Can I do it? she asked herself. Damside City was the nearest telegraph station. It lay nearly thirty-five miles due west of Al Hoot. It was merely a grain station for the district, and in no sense a village. She must make that point, and so intercept Hervey with a telegraphic message. It was her one chance. In spite of her lover, she would buy Hervey's silence, and trust to the future to set the rest straight. She was strong, and her horse was good. She must reach the office before it was closed at six o'clock that evening. She calculated it up, and she had just three hours in which to cover the distance. She looked out of the window. The wind was blowing from the east. That was good. It would ease the horse. She looked up at the sky. There was a few clouds scudding westwards. Yes, I'll do it, she said at last, if it kills poor Kitty. A moment later, Iredale returned with the mare. The girl waited not a second. Her lover assisted her into the saddle reluctantly. He did not approve of this sudden activity on the part of the girl. When she had settled herself, she bent down, and their lips met in one long, passionate kiss. "'Good-bye, George.' The man waved his adieu. His heart was too full to speak. She swung her mare round and galloped down the valley to the north. Her object was to clear the valley and then turn off to the west, on the almost disused trail to Damside. Iredale looked after her until the sound of the mare's hoofs died away in the distance. He was filled with wonder at her strange request and her hurried departure, but his speculations brought to him no definite conclusions, and he turned abruptly and called to his man, Chintz. The man hurried from the stable. "'We have been a little delayed. Is everything ready?' Airedale looked up at the sky, then down at the grizzled face before him. Chintz nodded. "'Good. Then get to work. Start the first fire directly beyond the graveyard to the east. The wind is getting up steadily.' You are sure there are no farms to the west of us between here and Rosy River? The man gave a negative shake of the head. That's all right, then. There will be no damage done, and the river will cut the fire off. This time tomorrow we shall be homeless wanderers, Chintz, you and I. And the smuggler laughed bitterly. Then his laugh died out. Well, to work. Set the fires going. End of chapter 17「Chapter Eighteen of the Hound from the North by Ridgewell Cullum. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Lisa Reichert. Chapter Eighteen The Forest Demon Pursues. Prudence swung her mare out on to the overgrown trail to Damside City. Kitty was a trim built little bronco, compact, well ribbed, and with powerful shoulders and chest. She was just the animal to stay and travel fast. The road cut through the heart of the Owl Hoot bush and ran in a diagonal direction southwest towards the border. Then it converged with the border trail which skirted the great southern muskeg, and, passing through a broken, stony country, went on to Damside. The wind was rapidly freshening, and the scudding clouds were quickly changing from white to grey, which, to the girl's practised mind, indicated an immediate change of weather but she thought little of the matter beyond being thankful that the wind was well behind her. She wished to travel fast, and a fair wind is as necessary to the horseman under such circumstances as it is to the mariner. For a time the roughness of the road required her attention. Kitty was sure-footed, but the outstanding roots with which her path was lined needed careful negotiation. 
Presently the trail became wider and its surface more even, and signs of recent usage became apparent. The roots were worn down and the projecting stones had been removed. Neither did it take the girl long to decide whose servants had done these things. On this obscure trail were to be seen many signs of the traffic upon which the owner of Lonely Ranch had been engaged. Now Prudence gave Kitty her head, and the mare travelled at a great pace. The breeze had chastened the laden air of the pine world. The redolent woods no longer scented the air which had in consequence become fresh and bracing. For the moment the emergency of her journey had dulled the girl's sensibilities to her surroundings. She looked out upon the beautiful tinted world, but she heeded nothing of what her eyes beheld. Her mind was set upon the object of her journey, and her thoughts were centred round the players in the drama of her life. How different her life seemed to have suddenly become from that which she had contemplated that morning. A great triumphant joy was with her, since her lover had established his innocence to her. Her troubles and anxieties were still many, and the least thing might upset every hope she entertained, but there was always with her the remembrance that George Iredale was innocent, and in that thought she felt a wonderful security. That he was a smuggler was a matter of insignificance. She loved him too well to let such knowledge narrow her estimation of him. She was too essentially of the prairie to consider so trifling a matter. Half the farmers in the country were in the habit of breaking the customs regulations by cutting wood and hay on government lands without a permit, and even hauling these things from across the border when such a course suited them. And in every case it was contraband, but they were thought no less of by their friends. Iredale was no worse than they, in spite of the fact that his offence carried with it a vastly heavier sentence. But for the dread that she might be too late to intercept her brother, Prudence would almost have been happy as she raced along that westward-bound trail. She knew her brother's nature well. She knew that he was vindictive, and no doubt her own treatment of him had roused his ire and all the lower instincts of his malignant nature. But she also knew that he loved money, needed money. His greed for gold was a gluttonous madness which he was incapable of resisting, and he would sacrifice any personal feeling, provided the inducement were sufficiently large. She meant that the inducement should be as large as even he could wish, and she knew that in this direction his ideas were extensive. Her one trouble, the one thought which alarmed her, was the question of time. If the office were closed when she arrived, her journey would have been in vain, for the operator lived in Ainsley and would have gone home. Hervey would have arrived in Winnipeg, and, by the time the office opened the following morning, the mischief would have been done. She flicked her mare with the end of her reins and touched her flank with her heel. Kitty responded with a forward bound. The increased speed was all too slow for the rapid thought and deadly anxiety of the girl, but she was too good a horsewoman to press the willing beast beyond a rational gait. The hardy mare propped jerkily, as she passed down the sharp side of a dried-out slough. She plunged through a thicket of long grass, and a grey cloud of mosquitoes rose and enveloped horse and rider. The vicious insect settled like a grey cloth upon the heated mare, and Prudence's soft flesh was punctured by hundreds of venomous needles at once. The girl swept the insects from her neck and face, heedless of the torturing stings. The mare fretted and raced up the opposite slope, while the girl leant forward in her saddle and sought to relieve the staunch little creature's agony by sweeping the poisonous insects from her steaming coat. The mare pressed on. Suddenly she threw up her head and snorted violently. Prudence was startled. Something had distracted Kitty's attention, and her wide-set eyes were cocked in alarm. Her nose was held high, and again and again she snorted. In consequence her pace was slackened and became awkward. She no longer kept a straight line along the trail, but moved from side to side in evident agitation. Prudence was puzzled and endeavoured to steady the creature, but Kitty was not to be easily appeased. She rattled her bit and mouthed it determinedly, grabbing at the sidebar with an evident desire to secure it in her teeth. The girl kept a tight rein and attempted to soothe her with the tender caress of her hand, but her efforts were unavailing. 
The ears were now turned backwards, and had assumed that curiously vicious inclination which in a horse is indicative of bad temper or equine terror. Kitty had no vice in her, and Prudence quickly understood the nature of her mare's feelings. The failure of her soothing efforts alarmed the girl. She sat up and looked about her. In the dense forest there seemed to be no unusual appearance. The trees were waving and bending in the wind, and their groanings had a sadly mournful effect upon the scene, but otherwise there was nothing strange to be observed. The sky had assumed a leaden hue, and in this direction the prospect was not alluring, but the clouds were fairly high, and there was no suggestion of immediate storm. Suddenly a couple of jackrabbits darted across the road. The mare propped, reared, and swung round toward the trees. Prudence brought her up to work, sharply. Then she saw that the rabbits were racing on ahead, down the trail. For the moment her patience gave way, and she dug her heel hard against Kitty's side, and the mare plunged forward. But her gait remained unsteady, and in her agitation she kept changing her stride, and once even tripped and nearly fell. A coyote, followed by his mate and two young ones, ran out onto the trail and raced along ahead of her. They did not even turn their heads to look at her. Further on a great timber wolf appeared and trotted along the edge of the woods, every now and then turning its head furtively to glance back. Then, quite suddenly, Prudence became conscious of something unusual. She raised her face to the grey vault of the sky and sniffed at the air. A pungent scent was borne upon the wind. The odour of resinous wood, so strong as to be sticky, came to her, and its pungency was not the ordinary scent of the forest about her. Half a dozen kit foxes dashed out onto the trail and joined in the race, and the yowl of the prairie dog warned her that other animals were about. The resinous odour grew stronger every moment, and at last Prudence detected the smell of smoke. She turned her head and looked back, and behind her, directly in her wake, she saw a thin grey haze which the wind was sweeping along above the trees. She drew her mare up to a stand, and as she sat looking back, a deadly fear crept into her eyes. Kitty resented the delay and reared and plunged in protest. The restraint maddened her, and all the time the girl saw that the smoke haze was thickening, and some strange distant sounds like the discharge of heavy ordnance reached her. The sweet oval face wore a strained expression, her eyes were wide open and staring, and the fear which looked out of them was fear of no ordinary danger. She watched the dull haze as it thickened and rolled on towards her. She saw it rise like great steam jets and wreathe itself upwards as fresh volumes displayed the lower strata. She saw the dull brown tint creep into it as it densified, and she knew that it was smoke. The rest needed no explanation beyond the evidence of her senses. The sickly resinous smell told her what had happened. The forest was on fire. The thought found vent in a muttered exclamation, then came an afterthought and the wind is blowing straight along behind me. For a moment she gazed about her wildly. She looked to the right and left. The forest walls were impassable. She looked back along the trail. The narrow, ribbon-like space was filled with a fog of smoke which was even now enveloping her. What should she do? There was nothing for it but to go on. But the fire must be travelling apace in the high wind. Still she stood, it seemed as though for the moment her faculties were paralyzed with the horror of her discovery. But at last she was moved to action. The mare became troublesome. The girl could no longer keep her still. The distracted animal humped her back and began to show signs of bucking. Then came a rush of animals along the trail. They came racing for dear life, and their numbers were augmented from the wooded depths which lined their route. Antelope led the way, their heads thrown up, and antlers pressed low down upon their backs as they seemed to fly over the sandy soil. Then came the loping dogs, coyotes, prairie wolves, birds of all sorts assembled in one long continuous flight. The animal kingdom of that region of forest seemed to have become united in their mutual terror. Wolf and hare, coyote and jackrabbit, hawks and blackbird, prairie chicken and grey owl, all sworn enemies in time of calm prosperity, but now, in their terror, companions to the last. 
and all the time in the growing twilight of smoke came the distant booming as of the discharge of great cannon. The girl leaned forward. She clapped her heel hard against the mare's side, and with a silent prayer joined in the race for life. She had no exact knowledge of how far these woods extended, or where the break would come which should cut off the fire. The wild beasts were spreading on down the trail, and with the instinct of her prairie world, she reasoned that in this direction alone must lie safety. The smoke grew denser and more choking. Her eyes became sore. Under her she felt the mare stretching herself to the utmost of her gait. She came up with many of the racing denizens of the forest, but they did not attempt to move off the trail at her approach. They were beyond the fear of human presence. A more terrible enemy was behind them, pursuing with gigantic strides which demolished space with incredible swiftness. Every moment the air grew hotter in spite of the mare's best efforts, and Prudence knew that the fire was gaining. Hill or dale made no difference now. It must be on, on, or the devouring monster would be upon them. Kitty never flagged, and with increasing speed her footing became even more sure. A loose line, with body bent well forward to ease the animal, Prudence did all she knew to assist her willing companion, but for every stride the faithful mare took, she knew that the fire was gaining many yards. The booming had increased to a steady roar, in the midst of which the deep thunderous detonations came, like the peals of raging storm. The wind rushed headlong forward, the fire bringing with it an almost cyclonic sweep of heated air. The mighty forest giants about her bent like reeds under the terrible force, and shrieked aloud their fears at the coming of the devouring demon. The mare rushed down into a wide hollow, a culvert bridged a reedy slough. The affrighted beast raced across it. The stream of the animal world swept on about her. She breasted the steep ascent opposite, and Prudence was forced to draw rein. She dared not allow the horse to race up such an incline, even though the fire were within a quarter of a mile of her. She would have been mad to exhaust the faithful creature, which was now her only hope. Even the poor forest creatures, mad as they were with terror, slackened their gait. At length the hilltop was gained, and a long descent confronted them. Kitty showed no signs of exhaustion yet, and faced her work amidst the rush of refugees with all her original zest. Down into the valley they tore, for the worst of all perils was in pursuit. The valley stretched away far into the distance. Ahead, here, in this hollow, the air was clearer. The hill had shut off the fog of smoke for the moment. The refugees now had a smooth run, and a faint glimmer of hope gladdened the heart of the girl. Without slackening her speed, she looked back at the hill, fearing to see the ruthless flames dart up over the path which her mare's feet had so recently trodden. But the flames had not yet reached the brow, and she sighed her satisfaction. The smoke was pouring over the tree-tops, and circling and rolling in a tangled mass, was creeping down into her wake, but as yet there were no flames. She looked this way and that at the dark green of the endless woods, the gracious fields of bending pines. She thought of the beauty which must soon pass away, leaving behind it only the charred skeletons, the barren, lifeless trunks which for years would remain to mark the cruel path of flame. Suddenly the roar which had partly died away into a vague, distant murmur beyond the hill burst out again with redoubled fury. Again she looked round, and the meaning was made plain to her. She saw the yellow fringe of flame as it came dancing, chaotic, a tattered ribbon of light upon the brow of the hill. She saw the dense pall of smoke hovering high above it, like the threat of some dreadful doom. The black of the forest upon the summit remained for a second, then over swept the red-gold fire, absorbing all, devouring all, in an almost torrential rush down to the woods below. And now she beheld a sea of living fire as the hills blazed before her eyes. It was as though the whole place had been lit at one touch. The sea rolled up with incredible swiftness as the tongues of flame licked up the inflammable objects they encountered. The efforts of her mare became puerile in comparison with the fearful pace of the flames. 
How could she hope to outstrip such awful speed? On, on raced the mare, and on came the molten torrent. Now the heat was intolerable. The girl leant limply over her faithful horse's neck. She was dizzy and confused. Every blast of the wind burnt her more fiercely as the fire drew nearer. She felt how utterly hopeless were her horse's efforts. The mare faltered in her stride. It was her first trip. The girl shrieked wildly. She screamed at the top of her voice like one demented. Her nerves were failing, and hysteria gripped her. Kitty redoubled her efforts. The fear of the fire was aggravated by the girl's wild cries, and she stretched herself as she had never done before. Now it seemed as though they were racing in the heart of a furnace. The whole country was in flames, and the roar and crashing of falling timber was incessant, and the yellow glow was everywhere, even overhead. Blinded, dazed, the girl was borne on by the faithful Kitty. She no longer thought of what was so near behind her. What little reason was left to her she centred upon keeping her seat in the saddle. An awful faintness was upon her, and everything about her seemed distant. Kitty alone fought out the battle of that ride. Her mistress was beyond all but keeping upon the faithful animal's back. Had she been less exhausted, the girl would have seen what her mare saw. She would have seen the broad stream of the rosy river ahead, and less than a quarter of a mile away. But she saw nothing. She felt nothing. She cared for nothing but her hold upon the saddle. This it was that when she came to the riverside, and the mare plunged from the steep bank into the deep, quick-flowing stream, she knew not what had happened. But with a strange tenacity, she held to the pummels of the saddle, while her loyal friend breasted the waters. How they got out of the river Prudence never knew, nor did she fully realize all that had happened, when at last the horse and rider again stood on firm ground, and the tough little bronco had covered another mile or more before the girl awoke to the fact that they were now in an open prairie country, and skirting the brink of the great southern muskeg. Then it all came back to her, and as Kitty kept steadily on, she looked fearfully about her. She saw away in the distance the awful pall, the lurid gleam of the flames, and a heartfelt prayer of thanksgiving went up from that lonely trail for the merciful escape which had been hers. The girl leant over her mare's shoulder and caressed the foaming neck. "'Good Kitty, faithful little mare!' she exclaimed emotionally. Then she looked ahead, and she remembered all. "'But on, girl, on! There is more to do yet!' The telegraph operator at Damside was closing up his little shack. He had just disconnected his instrument and was standing in his doorway, gazing out across the prairie to the east, watching the vast clouds of smoke belching from the direction of the woods. All about him was a heavy haze, and a nasty taste of smoke was in his mouth. He looked across to the only other buildings which formed the city of Damside, the grain elevator and the railway siding buildings. His own hut was close beside the latter. The men were leaving their work. Then presently he looked back in the direction of the distant fire. "'Tain't the prairie,' he muttered. "'Too thick. Guess the woods are blazin'. That's beyond the rosy. Can't cross there, so I reckon there's no danger to us. The air do stink here. Guess I'll go and get my hand-car and vamoose.' He turned back to the room and put on his hat. Just as he left his doorway to pass over to where his hand-car was standing on the railway track, he brought up to a halt. A horse and rider were racing up the trail towards him. "'Hello, what's this?' he exclaimed sharply. "'Maybe it is the prairie.' Prudence drew rein beside him. She had seen her man, and she knew that she was in time. Her joy was written in her face. "'My, but I've had a time!' she exclaimed, as she slid down from her saddle. I thought that fire had got me. Call up Winnipeg, please, Mr. Francis. Why, Miss Molling, have you ridden through that? asked the operator, pointing to the distant smoke. Not through it, but with it distinctly hot upon my heels, or rather my mare's, the girl laughed. But I want you to send a message for me. It isn't too late for Winnipeg? Late? Bless you, no. But what is it, prairie or forest? Forest, replied the girl shortly. Where's a form? They passed into the hut. 
Prudence proceeded to write out her message while the man connected up Winnipeg and carried on a short conversation. "'Bad fire,' he said. "'Very.' Prudence began to write. "'Just where?' "'Owl Hoot.' "'River'll stop it.' "'Yes.' "'Good.' Prudence went on writing. "'Ardell's ranch burnt out?' The girl started. "'I don't know.' "'Must be.' "'Oh.' "'Then, here you are, and do you mind if I wait for an answer?' "'Pleasure.' And the man read the message. "'To Hervey Malling, Northern Union Hotel, Winnipeg. "'Return at once, money awaiting you, "'willing to pay the price on your arrival. "'Do not fail to return at once. "'The other matter can rest. "'Prudence.' The operator tapped away at the instrument. Hervey was sitting in the Northern Union Hotel smoking room. He was talking to a burly man with a red face and a shock of ginger gray hair. This was the proprietor of the hotel. How long can you give me? I can settle everything by this day month. The harvesting is just finished. I only need time to haul the grain to the elevator. Will that satisfy you? The big man shrugged. You've put me off so often, Mr. Malling. It's not business, and you know it, he replied gutturally. Will you give me an order on your crop? He looked squarely into the other's face. Hervey hesitated. He knew that he could not do this, and yet he was sorely pressed for money. However, he made up his mind to take the risk. He thought his mother would not go back on him. Very well. He turned as the bellboy approached. "'Telegram for you, sir. Expressed.' Hervey took the envelope and tore it open. He read his sister's message, and a world of relief and triumph lit up his face. "'Good,' he muttered. Then he passed it to his companion. "'Read that. Do you still need a mortgage? I shall set out to-night.' The hotel proprietor read the message, and a satisfied smile spread over his face. It did not do for him to press his customers too hard. But still he was a business man. He, too, felt relieved. This relates to an outlying farm of mine which I have now sold. Your promise will be sufficient, Mr. Malling. I thought we should find an amicable settlement for our difficulty. You start tonight? Yes. End of chapter 18《ハウンドフロンドフォーク》ジュエル・カルム。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Lisa Reichert. Chapter 19 The Avenger Alice was standing at the gate of the little front garden. She was talking to her lover, who had just ridden up from the direction of Owl Hoot. Rob had not dismounted, and his face was very serious as he leant down towards her. And I never knew a word about it. It's a jolly good thing I obtained the delivery of his bunch of cattle when I did, or goodness knows what would have happened. Well, anyhow, I've lost a nice lump. My client, when he heard about the place being for sale, wanted to buy it for a back country for his beeves to winter in. Just my confounded luck. I knew there was a big fire out this way, but I never thought that Iredale was the unfortunate victim. Now I've got to go over to Lakeville to see him. He's staying there, you know, since he was burnt out. I'll come back this way, and if Mrs. Malling can put me up for the night, I'll be grateful. My plug won't stand the journey back home. You say Hervey will be along this evening? Yes, replied the girl, then seriously, what are you going to do? Interview him. There are things about that dog that want explaining. I take it he can explain em. I don't easily forget. And I owe someone a deal more than I've been able to pay. Perhaps that dog'll help me discharge my debt. Goodbye, Al. I must be off or I shan't get back this afternoon. Rob turned away in his cheerful, debonair manner and rode off. Troubles sat lightly on his stout heart. His effervescent nature never left him long depressed when fortune played her freakish tricks upon him. He had lost his commission upon the sale of Iredale's land. But he had secured the better deal of the cattle. Therefore, he was satisfied. But Rob was a very persistent man in his seemingly haphazard fashion. He had promised himself an interview with Hervey about his dog. He had never forgotten or forgiven the disaster in the mountains. 
and he believed that Hervey would be able to set him on the track of Zachary Smith, whom he felt certain he had seen at the Winnipeg depot. He hoped so, and for this purpose he intended to spend the night at Loondike Farm. As her lover rode away, Alice turned back to the house. The anxious look was still upon her face. She knew that there was serious trouble in the family, and she could see no way of helping these people she loved. Prudence was in sad disgrace with her mother. She had been absent from the farm for two days, and had only returned that morning. Mrs. Molling had been distracted with anxiety and grief, until the reappearance of her daughter, and then, when she saw that she was well and that no accident had happened to her, she had flown into such a terrible passion that even Prudence had quailed before her. Never in her life had Alice seen the kindly old soul give way to such rage. No disparaging epithet had been too bad for her child, and she had literally chased the girl from the room in which they had met. Since then, Prudence had retreated to her bedroom, and Hepzibah had poured out the vials of her wrath upon an empty kitchen, for even the long-suffering hired girl had feared to face her. Now, as Alice approached the front door again, she heard the sound of high-pitched voices coming from the kitchen. Sarah Gurridge had come over while the farm wife's anger was at its height, and as Alice listened, she thought these two old cronies were quarrelling. But her ears quickly told her that her surmise was wrong. She heard Prudence's voice raised in angry protest, and instead of entering the house, she discreetly withdrew, passing round to the farmyard instead. In the kitchen a stormy scene was being enacted. Prudence was standing just inside the door. Her mother was beside a long table on which were laid out the necessaries for pastry-making. She had faced round upon the girl and stood brandishing a rolling-pin in one hand, and in the other she held a small basket of eggs. Sarah was seated in a high-backed Windsor chair. Her arms were folded across her waist, and her face expressed perplexed alarm. Prudence's face was aflame, nor were her eyes one whit less angry than her mother's. "'But I say you shall hear me, mother, whether you like it or not. I'll not let you or anyone else call me the filth which you did this morning for nothing.' The girl's voice was hoarse with nervous feeling. Mrs. Molling shook her rolling-pin in a perfect fury. "'Out of this kitchen, you baggage! Out of it, do you hear me? Go and get your garments packed up, and out you go into the street. Child of my flesh, are you? Out of my house, you drab, or I'll be doing you a harm. I'll teach the like of you to be stopping out o' nights, and then to come back without a word of explaining. I'll teach you.' "'Give the child a hearing, Hepzibah,' said Sarah, in her soft, even tones as there came a lull in the angry mother's tirade. Prudence shot a grateful glance in her preceptor's direction. Hepzibah turned swiftly on the peaceful Sarah, but the words of anger which hovered upon her lips remained unspoken. Sarah was an influence in the old lady's life, and long association was not without effect. She visibly calmed. Prudence saw the change and took advantage of it. "'How could I explain when you wouldn't listen to me?' she exclaimed resentfully. Almost before I could say a word, you called me all the shameful things you could think of. You drove me to silence when I was willing to tell you all. I was more than willing. You must know all, for the story I have to tell as nearly affects you as it does me. I stayed away from home to save an innocent man from the dreadful charge of murder, and your son from perpetrating the most wanton act of his worthless life. A dead silence followed her words. Hepzibah stared at her with an expression of stupefied amazement, while Sarah turned in her chair with a movement which was almost a jolt. The silence was at last broken by the girl's mother. Murder? Hervey? And there was no understanding in her tone. Her mind seemed to be groping blindly, and she merely repeated the two words which struck her most forcibly. Yes, murder and Hervey, Prudence retorted. Hervey has accused George Iredale of the murder of Leslie Gray. Now will you listen to my explanation? Hepzibah precipitated herself into a chair. The rolling pin was returned to its place upon the dough board with a clatter, and the basket of eggs was set down with a force that sorely jeopardized its contents. Yes, girl, tell me all. Let me hear what devil's work my Hervey's been up to. La sakes! 
and George Iredale a murderer. And Prudence, her anger evaporated as swiftly as her mother's, told the two old ladies of her love for Iredale, and how he had asked her to be his wife. She told them how Hervey had come to her with the story of his discovery, how, after attempting to blackmail his victim, he had offered his information to her at a price, how she forced him to prove his case, and had sent him to Winnipeg with that object, how she had been nearly distracted, and eventually made up her mind to go and see Iredale herself, how the accused man had established to her his innocence beyond any doubt, and how he had shown her how impossible it would be for him to use the same means of clearing himself in a court of law. She dwelt upon each point so that these two, who were so dear to her, should not fail to understand as she understood. Then she told them how, recognizing George's danger, she had resolved to intercept Hervey, and, with her mother's assistance, pay him off, and finally, how she had been overtaken by the forest fire, and how her mare, exhausted, had arrived at Damside in time to send her message to her brother, and how, failing any other means of returning home, she had taken shelter with the elevator clerk's wife until her mare had recovered and she was able to resume her journey to the farm. It was a long story, and the many interruptions of her mother gave the girl much extra trouble in the telling, but with a wonderful patience, born of her anxiety for her lover, she dealt with every little point that puzzled her audience. When the story was finished, its effect was made curiously manifest. The one thing which seemed to have gripped her mother's intensest feeling was the part her boy had played. Her round eyes had grown stern, and her comely lips had parted as her breath came heavy and fast. At last she burst out with a curious mixture of anger and sorrow in her words. "'Bones of my Silas! Flesh of my flesh! And to think o' the like! My Hervey a whelp of hell, a bloodsucker! Oh, that I should a lived to see such a day!' And she rocked herself, with her hand supporting her head and her elbows planted upon her knees. "'Oh, them travellings in foreign parts! My poor, poor Silas! If he'd just lived long enough to get round our boy with a horsewhip, we might have been spared this disgrace. Prudence, girl, I'm that sorry for what I've said to you.' Tears welled in the old eyes, which had now become very wistful, and slowly rolled down the plump cheeks. Suddenly she gathered up her apron and flung it up over her head, and the rocking continued dismally. Prudence came over to her and knelt at her side, caressing her stout figure in sympathy. Sarah sat looking away towards the window with dreamy eyes. The old schoolmistress made no comment. She was thinking deeply. "'Don't cry, mother,' said Prudence, with an ominous catch in her voice. "'Whatever Hervey's faults, he will reap his own punishment. I want you to help me now, dear.' I want you to give me the benefit of your experience and your sound practical sense. I must see this through. I have a wicked brother and an obstinate lover to deal with, and I want you to help me and tell me what is best to do. The apron was removed from Mrs. Mollings' head, and her eyes, red and watery, looked at the girl at her side with a world of love in their depths. These two men will be here this afternoon, the girl went on. George is coming to tell you his story himself, that you may judge him. He declares that, come what may, he will not rest with this shadow upon him. In justice to us, his friends, and to himself, he must face the consequences of his years of wrongdoing. Hervey will be here for his money. This is the position, and, according to my reckoning, they will arrive at about the same time. I don't quite know why— but I want to confront Hervey with the man he accuses. Now tell me what you think. I'm thinking you make the third of a pack of fool-heads, said the farm-wife gently. George is no murderer. He's not the killin' sort. He's a man, he is. Then why were it? And say, if that boy o' mine comes along, he'll learn that them arctic goldfields is a cooler place for his likes than his mother's farm. The old woman's collar was rising again with tempestuous suddenness. 
say he's worse'n a skunk and a sight more dangerous than a greaser my but he'll learn something from them as can teach him yes mother replied the girl a little impatiently but you don't seem to see the seriousness of what he charges that i do miss am i wantin in understandin george is as innocent as an unborn babe so what's the odds along o hervey's accusin it don't amount to a heap o corn shucks that boy ain't responsible i tell ye he's like to get locked up himself in a loony asylum i'll give him accusin but mother that won't do any good he must be paid off and so he shall child there's more dollars in this farm than he reckons on and they're ready for usin when i say the word if it's pay that's needed he shall be paid though i ain't just understandin the need sarah's voice broke in at this point the child's right hepzibah there's money to be spent over this thing or i'm no judge of human nature Hervey's got a strong case, and from what the story tells us, George is a doomed man if he goes before the court. Innocent he may be, innocent he is, I'll wager. But if he's obstinate, he's done for. The farm wife made no reply, but sat gazing wistfully before her. Yes, yes, Prudence said earnestly. It is just the money, nothing more. We must not let an innocent man suffer and aunt sarah we must prevail upon george to let us stop hervey's mouth that is our chief difficulty you will help me you and mother you are so clever aunt sarah george will listen to you oh we must must save him even against himself sarah nodded her head sagely she was deeply affected by all she had heard but she gave no outward sign child she replied we will do our best for him for you but yours is the tongue that will persuade him best he loves you child and you love him he will not persist if you are set against it i hope it will be as you say replied prudence dubiously but when he comes you will let him tell his story in his own way you will listen patiently to him then you can laugh at his determination and bring your arguments to bear then we will keep him until hervey arrives and we will settle the matter for ever oh mother i dread what is to come mrs malling did not seem to be paying much heed but as the girl moved away from her side she spoke there was no grief no anger in her voice now she spoke quite coldly and sarah gurridge looked keenly over at her yes girl we'll settle this rumpus and hervey Prudence moved towards the door. She turned at her mother's words. "'I will go upstairs,' she said. "'I want to think.' She opened the door and nearly fell over the dog Nesh who was standing outside it. There was a fanciful suggestion of the eavesdropper about the creature. His attitude was almost furtive. He moved slowly away and walked with the girl to the foot of the stairs, where he laid himself down with a complacent grunt. The girl went up to her room." this day's doin's will be writ on my heart for ever said the farm wife plaintively as the door closed behind her daughter and see you hepzibah and let no eyes read of them for there will be little credit for any one in those same doings said sarah solemnly mrs malling hugged herself and again began to rock slowly but there was no signs of tears in her round dark eyes now and again her lips moved and occasionally she muttered to herself Sarah heard the name Hervey pass her lips once or twice, and she knew that her old friend had been sorely stricken. As the time for Iredale's arrival drew near, Prudence became restless. Her day had been spent in idleness as far as her farm work was concerned, and she had chosen the companionship of Alice, and had unburdened her heart to her. But sympathetic and practical as her friend was, she was quite unable to help her. As four o'clock drew near, however, Alice did the only thing possible. She took herself off for a walk down the Lakeville Trail. She felt that it was better for everybody that she should be away while the trouble was on, and besides, she would meet her lover on his way to the farm and give him timely warning against making his meditated stay for the night. At the appointed hour there came the clatter of a pacer's hoofs at the front gate, and a moment later Prudence led her lover into the parlour. 
After a few brief words, she hurriedly departed to summon her mother and Sarah. There was a significant solemnity in this assembling, nor was it lessened by the smuggler's manner. Even the wolfish Nesh seemed impressed with what was happening, for he clung to the girl's heels, following her wherever she went, and finally laid down upon the trailing portion of her skirt, when she took up her position beside her lover and waited for him to begin. The opening was a painful one for everybody. Iredale scarcely knew how to face those gentle folk and recount his disgraceful story. He thought of all they had been to him during his long years upon the prairie. He thought of their implicit trust and faith in him. He almost quailed before the steady, honest eyes of the old people. However, he at last forced himself to his task and plunged into his story with uncompromising bluntness. "'I am accused of murder,' he said, and paused, while a sickly feeling pervaded his stomach. Mrs. Molling nodded her head. She was too open to remain silent long. "'Of Leslie Gray?' she said at once. "'And ye needn't be tellin' us nothin' more, George. We know the yarn you are about to tell us, and ye think we're going to believe any addle-pated scallywag such as Hervey agin you? Smuggler you may be, but that ye have sunk to kill in human flesh, not even a minister of the gospel's going to convince me. Here I respects the man I give my hand to. Shake me by the hand, George, shake me by the hand.' and the farm-wife rose from her chair and ambled across the room with her hand outstretched. Iredale clasped it in both of his, and never in his life had he experienced such a burst of thankfulness as he did at that moment. His heart was too full to speak. Prudence smiled gravely as she watched this whole-hearted token of her mother's loyalty to a friend, nor was Sarah backward in her expression of goodwill. Hepzibah's right, George and she speaks for both of us. But there's work to be done for all that. Hervey's to be dealt with. To be bribed, said Hepzibah uncompromisingly, as she returned to her seat. Iredale shook his head, and his face set sternly. Prudence saw the look she feared creep into her lover's eyes. She opened her lips to protest, but the words remained unspoken. She had heard the rattle of a buckboard outside. The sound died away, and she knew that the vehicle had passed round to the barn. She waited in an agony of suspense for her brother's appearance. "'You needn't to shake your head,' went on the farm-wife. "'This matter's my concern. It's my dollars as is going to pay, Master Hervey, and when he gets em, may they blister his fingers, I says.' Prudence heard a footstep in the hall. The crucial moment had arrived, and her heart palpitated with nervous apprehension before iredale could reply the door was flung open and hervey stood in their midst instantly every eye was turned upon him he stood for a moment and looked round there was a slight unsteadiness in his attitude his great eyes looked wilder than ever and they were curiously bloodshot at least one of the three ladies possessed an observant mind sarah saw that the man had been drinking to her the signs though slight were unmistakable the others did not seem to notice his condition. "'Ah,' he said, with an attempt at pleasantry, "'a nice little party. Well, I have come for the dibs.' His eyes lit upon the figure of George Iredale, and he broke off. The next moment he went on angrily. "'What's that man doing in this house?' he cried, his eyes fiercely blazing with sudden rage. "'Is the place turned into a refuge for murderers?' The man's fury had set fire to the powder train. His mother was on her feet in a twinkling. Her comfortable body fairly shook in her indignation. Her face was a flaming scarlet, and her round eyes sparkled wickedly. "'And who be you to question the calling of my house, Hervey Malling? she cried. "'Since when comes it that you've the right to raise your voice against my guests? And by what right do you dare to accuse an innocent man? Answer me, you imp of evil!' she demanded but she gave him no time to speak, and went on, her voice rising to a piercing crescendo. "'Spare your wicked tongue, which should be forked by reason of the lies as has fallen from it. Oh, that you should be able to call me mother! I'd rather mother the offspring of a rattlesnake than you. What have you done by us all your life but bring sorrow and trouble upon those who've done all that which is in them to help you? Coward! Traitor! 
and you come now with lies on your tongue to harm an innocent man that's done you no harm she breathed hard then her wrath swept on and the room rang with the piercing pitch of her voice you've come for your blood money your thirty pieces you villain if your poor father were alive this day he should lay a raw hide about you till your bones were flayed sakes i've a mind to set about you myself look at you the black heart look at him was ever such filth of a man and him my son blood money blood money and to think that i'm living to know it she paused hervey broke in silence you old fool you don't know what you're talking about that man pointing over at iredale who sat waiting for an opportunity to interfere is the murderer of leslie gray i suppose he's been priming you with blarney and yarns but i tell you he murdered gray i'm not here for any tomfoolery i got prudence's message to say the money was forthcoming where is it fifteen thousand dollars buys me and that i want at once if i have any more yapping i'll make it twenty thousand he looked about him savagely and his eyes finally paused on george iredale seated beside prudence he cared nothing for his mother's vituperation but he was watchful of the smuggler suddenly the burly rancher sprang to his feet he stepped up to hervey the latter moved a pace back not one cent you cowardly hound he roared not one cent shall you have do you hear i thank god that i am here to stop you robbing these your mother and sister mrs molling tried to interfere but he waved her back i've come at the right time and i tell you that you shall not take one cent of the money i will never leave you lest you should wheedle it from them i will spoil your game that is what i intend to do you and i will set out for winnipeg to-night and together we will interview the commissioner of police do you understand me i have the whip in hand now and i promise you your silence shall not be bought prudence interfered listen to me george i implore you not to do this thing hervey can have all he wants everything you are innocent we know but you cannot prove your innocence why should you break my heart when there is a way out of the difficulty there is but one person who can denounce you and his silence we can purchase oh george the girl went on passionately as you love me listen my heart will break if this thing you meditate comes to pass oh my love say you won't do it let mother pay the man off that he may pass out of our lives for ever see mother is going for the money now it is so easy so simple mrs molling had risen from her seat and moved away to the door hervey stood at the far end of the parlour facing the open window he saw his mother pass out and a great look of satisfaction came into his eyes after all these women meant to treat him fairly he thought he grinned over at iredale better drop it iredale and don't play the fool when i get the money i shall forget that i ever knew you the smuggler was about to fire a swift retort when the sound of voices coming in at the open window interrupted him the voices were a man's and a woman's prudence recognized alice's tones the others she did not recognize at once sarah gurridge who had been a silent observer of the scene had heard the sound too but she was absorbed in what was being enacted about her her eyes were upon hervey she saw him start and his great haunting eyes were turned upon the window suddenly he rushed forward towards it he had to pass round the table close to where prudence was now standing in doing so he kicked against the dog which was standing with its ears pricked up and its head turned in the direction whence the voices sounded the man's evil face was blanched a wild hunted look was in his eyes iredale saw was startled and his reply died upon his lips as he wondered at this sudden change shut the window do you hear cried hervey excitedly don't let them hear don't let them he had reached the window to carry out his own instructions his hands were upon the casements and he was about to fling the glass frames together but suddenly his arms dropped to his sides he stood face to face with the figure of rob chillingwood there was a dreadful silence then slowly hervey backed away his glaring eyes were fixed upon the stern countenance of the ex-customs officer slowly he backed backed from the apparition and the onlookers noted the pallid cheeks and blazing eyes and they wondered helplessly nor did hervey pause until he reached the wall furthest from the window then he stood and his lips silently moved 
Suddenly there was a cry, and it rang with vengeful triumph. It came from the man at the window, Rob Chillingwood. By God, it's Zachary Smith! The next instant and he was in the room. The onlookers gazed blankly from one to the other of the two men. What did it mean? Who was Zachary Smith? And why did Rob so call Hervey? Then their eyes settled on the man against the wall. His cheeks were no longer pallid. They were flushed with a hectic colouring, and those strange eyes were filled with an awful, murderous light. The lips continued to move, but he did not speak. Only his right hand slipped round behind him. Then Rob's voice sounded through the room again. "'So, Mr. Zachary Smith, we meet again. And by the Lord, Harry, you shall swing for what you did in the mountains. Highway robbery of the government bullion, under the charge of Leslie Gray, and the murder of our Indian guide, Rainy Moon.' Then he turned. "'Hold that door!' he shouted, and Iredell sprang to obey. But Prudence rushed forward, but Sarah stopped her and drew her back. A wild laugh came from Hervey's direction. "'And who's going to take me?' he cried. "'You, Rob Chillingwood? You? Ha-ha!' And his maniacal laugh rang out again. "'Look to yourself, you fool. Gray crossed my path, and he paid for it with his life. You shall follow him.' While his words yet rang upon the air, his hand shot out from behind him, gripping a heavy revolver. The pistol was raised, and a shriek went up from the two ladies. Suddenly there was a rush, a snarl, and a great body seemed to literally hurl itself through the air. A shot rang out. Simultaneously a cry echoed through the room. Hervey staggered as something seized him by the throat and tore away the soft flesh. Another shot followed. It all happened in a twinkling. Hervey fell to the ground with a gurgling cry, and Nesh, the dog until then forgotten by everybody, rolled over by his side with one dying yelp of pain. Then silence reigned throughout the room, and all was still. Iredale returned his smoking pistol to his pocket and went over to Hervey's side. His movement seemed to release the others from the spell under which they had been held. Rob, unharmed by Hervey's shot, came forward, and Sarah and Prudence followed in his wake, but Iredale waved the ladies back. "'Stand away, please,' he said quietly. "'The dog had finished him before I got my shot in to save him. The brute has literally torn his throat out.' Then he looked over at the dead hound. "'It's awful. I wonder what made the dog turn upon him.' "'Are they both dead?' asked Rob in an awestruck voice. Iredale nodded. It must have been the sight of Hervey's leveled pistol that made the dog rush at him, said Prudence. I've seen him do so before. Strange, strange, murmured Iredale. The dog feared firearms, said Sarah. Perhaps he had reason, observed Rob significantly. He only has three sound legs. By God, and not content with his victims in the mountains, he... But yes, I see it. This man came here without expecting to meet Gray or me. Rob broke off and looked at Prudence. Of course, I'm beginning to understand. You and Gray were to have been married. Then he turned back to the contemplation of the dead bodies. Yes, the murderer of Gray lies confessed, said Iredale quietly, and I think that his motives were even stronger than those attributed to... Prudence placed a hand over his mouth before he could complete his sentence. They were startled from their horrified contemplation of the work of those last few moments by the sound of Hepzibah's voice calling from her bedroom. The sitting-room door had been opened by Alice, who had entered the moment Iredale had released the handle. Now they could hear the farm-wife moving about overhead, evidently on her way downstairs. Sarah was the first to recover her presence of mind. She turned upon Rob. Not a word to her about... about... Rob shook his head. Iredale snatched the pistol from the dead man's hand. Mrs. Molling's footsteps came creaking down the stairs. Suddenly Prudence's hands went up to her face as she thought of the shock awaiting her mother. Alice dragged her away to a chair. Iredale and Rob stood looking down at the two objects on the floor. Master and Hound were lying side by side. Sarah ran to the door and met the farm wife. She must never know that her son was a murderer, a double murderer. Those within the room heard the schoolma'am's gentle tones. 
no no hepzibah you must not go in there yet there are things things which you must not see the hound has killed him hervey enraged the dog and the wretched beast turned upon him and he is dead then there came the sound of a scuffle the next moment mother hepsy pushed her way into the room she looked about her wildly one hand was clutching a bundle of hundred-dollar bills suddenly her round staring eyes fell upon the two objects lying side by side upon the ground she looked at the hound then she looked upon her son iredale had covered the torn throat with pocket handkerchiefs the bills slowly fell in a shower from her hand and her arms folded themselves over her breast then she looked in a dazed fashion upon those about her muttering audibly he's dead he's dead she repeated to herself over and over again then suddenly she ceased her repetitions and shook her head mussy a me mussy a me the lord's will be done and she slowly fell in a heap by her dead son's side end of chapter nineteen section twenty of the hound from the north by ridgewell cullum this librivox recording is in the public domain read by lisa reichert final section in conclusion time the great healer of all sufferings all sorrows can do much but memory clings with a pertinacity which defies all time's best efforts time may soften the poignancy of deep-rooted sorrow but it cannot shut out altogether the pain of a mother's grief at the loss of an only son in spite of all hervey's crimes he was the only son of his mother and she was a widow the story of his villainies was rigidly kept from her and so she thought of him only as a prodigal as a boy to be pitied as one whose offences must be condoned she sought for his good points and in her sweet motherly heart saw a wonderful deal in him on which to centre her loving memory which had he lived even she could never have discovered it is something that erring man has to be humbly grateful for that women are like this so full of the patient enduring love which can see no wrong in the object of their affections but loon dyke farm became intolerable to hepzibah malling after the ghastly tragedy of her son's death and when rob and alice saw fit to marry urged on to that risky experiment by the two older ladies she insisted upon leasing the place to them at ridiculously easy terms she would have given it to them only for their steady refusal to accept such a magnificent wedding gift from her the old lady was rich enough for her needs and her daughters and business woman as she was she was generous to a fault where her affections were concerned prudence too was satisfied with any arrangement which would take her away from the farm knowing what she knew of her brother loondyke could never again be her home so mother and daughter retired to ainsley and only once again did they return to their old home on the briefest of visits and that was to assist at the function of christening the son and heir of the chillingwoods later on prudence induced her mother to make winnipeg her home but though for her daughter's sake she acceded to the request she was never quite at ease among her new surroundings nor was sarah gurridge when she visited her old friend during her holidays slow to observe this my dear she told alice one day after her summer vacation hepzibah is failing fast she's quite old although she is my junior by two years and three months an idle life doesn't suit her and as for prudence she wears fine clothes and goes out in society all day and most of the night but she's that thin and melancholy that you wouldn't know her for the same child it's my opinion that she's pining they are both pining i found a letter from hamilton when i got back home it was from george iredale and i'm going to answer it at once and what are you going to say in your reply laughed alice i know your matchmaking propensity so does rob the quiet dreamy face of the old schoolmistress smiled over at the happy mother say she exclaimed i'm going to give george a piece of my mind for staying away so long i know why he's doing so 
and my belief as to the cause of his absence is different from what Prudence is beginning to imagine. She thinks he has left her because of her brother's doings, and it's that that's driving her to an early grave. I shall certainly tell George what I think, and Sarah wagged her head sagely. And she was as good as her word. She had not seen fit to tell Alice that she had been in constant communication with George Iredale ever since the day of the tragedy, or that she was in his confidence as regarded Prudence. George had left the district to give both Prudence and her mother time to recover from the shock, and now that a year or more had passed away, he had written, appealing to Sarah to tell him if she thought the time auspicious for his return. In a long, carefully worded letter, Sarah advised him not to delay. By dint of much perseverance, she wrote, I have persuaded the child out of her absurd notions about the reflections her brother's doings have cast upon her. She looks at things from a healthier standpoint now. Why should she not marry? What has she done to debar her from fulfilling the mission which is appointed for every woman? Nothing. And I am sure if a certain man should return and renew the appeal which he made at the time when the Lord's anger was visited upon her brother, she would give him a different reply. However, I must not waste all my space upon the silly notions of a child with a misdirected conscience. And how her letter bore fruit, and how George Iredale returned and sought prudence in the midst of the distractions of Winnipeg's social whirl, and how the girl's answer, when again he appealed to her, turned out to be the one Sarah had prophesied for him, were matters of great satisfaction to the sage old schoolmistress. She assisted at the wedding which followed. She saw the bride and bridegroom off at the railway depot. She remained to console her old friend for the loss of her daughter. Then she hied her off once more back to the bleak, staring schoolhouse, where she continued to propound sage maxims for the young of the district, until her allotted task was done and the tally of her years complete. The End End of The Hound from the North by Ridgewell Cullum Read by Lisa Reigert, Winnipeg Native